thank you again for giving us a day of rest from our normal activities and to meet with us. We thank you for your word and for the sacraments and for your spirit. We pray that you would be with us now. We pray that we would be changed by the renewing of our minds through your word. We pray that you conform us more to the image of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, please be seated and turn, if you will, in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. As you're turning there, it's by way of introduction. If you were to ask people today, how are you right with God? We might get a variety of different answers. Some people might say, well, just do your best. Some people might say that God helps those who help themselves. Some people might say, there is no God, don't, don't worry about it. Others might say, all roads lead to God, just be sincere. Um, but we want to look at what Scripture says about how are we right with God is by faith alone in Christ alone. And actually, one of the rallying cries of the Protestant Reformation, they had what we know are the five solas of the Reformation. We believe that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, and according to the scriptures alone. And we recognize many others believe in some of these things. They believe in grace and faith and Christ and God's glory, but it's the alone part uh, that really sets apart what we're, we do in Pro Presbyterian and Reformed churches or in order to get the gospel right, that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And here is uh, one of the passages that really highlights that for us. We recognize that to be right before God, in, order, in other words, to be righteous before God, there's both a legal and a relational aspect to that. And in Adam, we were legally separated from God. We were condemned. We were by nature Scripture says, children of wrath, which is the worst news that we could possibly hear. By nature, we're dead in our trespasses and sins, and we're separated from God. We're under condemnation. But in Adam, we were also relationally separated from God. We were enemies. We were sinners. We were foreigners. We were strangers. We were both guilty and corrupt. And so how can we be right with God? How can this happen is uh, by the gift that he gives us in Christ and the gift that he gives us to even have faith to believe in Jesus Christ. And we recognize this in particular as we look at this passage from the Apostle Paul in Philippians today. I'd like to consider uh, the title of the sermon is A Tale of Two Righteousnesses. And I know that's not really a word, but a little riff off uh, Charles Dickens there. The, a Tale of Two Righteousnesses. You're either righteous uh, by the way of the law in which no one will be saved, or you're righteous by faith alone in Christ, which everyone who believes in him will be saved. And so here we hear three things. We hear Paul's warning as a pastor. We hear Paul's resume as a Pharisee, and Paul's accounting as a Christian. So we hear Paul's res warning as a pastor, Paul's resume as a Pharisee, and Paul's accounting as a Christian. And so let's consider these things as we hear now the word of God in Philippians chapter 3, Starting in verse 1, Paul writes this. He says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you is no trouble to me, and it is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So far, the reading of God's holy word. 
And so we want to look at these three things today. First, Paul's warning as a pastor. Here, Paul's warning against what uh, is sometimes called the, the Judaizers. And they taught that Gentiles must first become Jews and then obey all of the Old Covenant ceremonial laws in order to uh, maintain or get salvation. And really, this is abhorrent to Paul. He writes about this in Galatians as well. Paul will not tolerate a different gospel. He will tolerate, uh, he could rejoice if the gospel was preached, even if it was preached from wrong motives. He rejoiced that the gospel was preached, but a different gospel is abhorrent to him. There is no salvation in it. There is no hope in it. It's misrepresenting Jesus Christ. It's robbing people of salvation itself because getting the gospel right couldn't be more important. It's the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. And so Paul here is talking to uh, the church in Philippi and he's warning them as a pastor. He's saying, beware, look out. He wants them to look out for a couple things. First for the dogs, then for the evildoers, and then for those who mutilate the flesh. Well, first for the dogs, right? In our society today, right, dogs are lovable, little, huggable pets and creatures. Um, but in that day, it would have been a term of derision. They were unworthy. Dogs were unworthy of anything holy. Well, not all dogs. They did have pets. But uh, in general, they were considered ritually unclean. They would eat anything, including dead animals, human corpses, even their own vomit. So they were kind of seen as... Uh, unclean. They were outside the covenant. Ironically, it was a term that the Jews used to talk about the Gentiles. And now Paul is flipping it and say, if you tell someone that they have to go back to all the laws of Judaism, they're the dogs. They're the unclean ones. They're the ones who are outside. He's really flipping the tables on something significant here. And then he says, and beware of the evildoers. Ironically, again, it's those who held on to their keeping of the law and their good works are called the evildoers. It's not necessarily that they were just do, doing bad things, but the ones who think that their good works are what gets them right with God or their good works are the things that merit salvation. Their emphasis on the works of the law turns it into a self-reliance that obscures the need for salvation that comes by faith in Christ. And as you remember, was Abraham, I'm going to ask you, answer this out loud. Beloved, was Abraham justified by faith or by works? By faith. By faith. And so is everyone who is a son of Abraham. And so it's not by works of the law. By works of the law, no one will be justified before God. And so he says, watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the unclean ones. Watch out for the evildoers, those who think it's through self-reliance. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. This is a play on words as well. Instead of calling their adherence to the law circumcision, which was the right of the old covenant, he says it's mutilating and cutting. He's really saying it's a pagan ritual. Do you remember when uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal had the battle on Mount Carmel and the people were cutting themselves? They're mutilating their flesh trying to appease their gods. In essence, what Paul is saying is if you're relying on your circumcision as if that work of the law is what gets you right with God apart from faith, then it's just like the pagans. You're cutting yourself. You're mutilating your flesh. You're, uh, you're missing the whole point. It was by faith that Abraham was right before God, and circumcision was a sign and seal of that covenant, of the, faith, of the righteousness that he had by faith, but it's not circumcision in and of itself. It's not the rituals in and of themselves that make them right. And so one theologian said, although national identities and sacred ceremonies are not viewed as bad in themselves, they are rejected as the foundation for one's relationship with God or with fellow believers. In other words, Jesus plus or minus anything is a false religion. It's Christ alone. It's in him that we have the forgiveness of our sins. It's in him that we have righteousness. It's in him that we have the hope of glory. It's in him that we have an inheritance. We confess that uh, we, believe, we, we receive Christ plus all of his benefits by faith alone. So if we add something to Jesus or if we take something away from Jesus, that's a false gospel. That's a false religion. That's what Paul is warning about. And it was prevalent in his day. It's prevalent in our day. Jesus plus your good works, false religion. Jesus plus some other god or leader or religion. Jesus minus those things. False religion. Christ alone. And this is what the apostle wants to 
uh, proclaim. This is what he wants to make clear. So that's his warning as a pastor, but let's consider his resume as a Pharisee. Paul goes on to say, if anyone could have confidence in the flesh, I have all the more. He's recognizing, right, according to the flesh or according to the works of the law, he did it. He was zealous about these things. You know, you hear sometimes that it's not bragging if you can back it up. I don't know if you're old enough to remember a basketball player named Larry Bird. He's a great player, played for the Boston Celtics. And that he used to go to the three-point competition every year in the NBA for the All-Star game. And it's rumored that he would walk into the locker room and say, all right, boys, who's shooting for second? Right? <laughs> because he knew he was going to win. He was that good. It'd be like uh, Carly Caitlin or whoever it is today, right? Um, just going out, they were that good that they know, hey, who's shooting for second place? And it's not bragging if you could back it up, and he often won. And here Paul's talking about what he's done and what he did. If anybody should have confidence in the flesh, then it's him. And so then he lists a couple things here, four privileges that he has from God as his heritage, and then three accomplishments. So seven things in total. Four of them are heritage and privileges, which he had nothing to do with. And the other three were accomplishments. And so the first one of them, he says he was circumcised on the eighth day. In other words, he's an eighth dayer. According to the very strict practice, that was when it should be done. Not everyone was able to do that for one reason or another, but if you want to do it and you want to do it right, you're circumcised on the eighth day. Obviously, as an eight-day-old, this wasn't something he did for himself, right? This was Ma and Pa Paul. Uh, like bringing him forward to, to have him circumcised. But he's recognized, like, according to the law, he was circumcised on the eighth day. Leviticus 12, 3 says this. Secondly, he says he's an Israelite. In other words, he's of the chosen people. He's of the, the ones that God revealed his promises to through Abraham. His racial descent, his national heritage is the chosen people of God. And among those people, he narrows it down to the third thing. He says, of the tribe of Benjamin. That was the son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel, pregnant with him in the story that we heard today. She died while giving birth to him. It was the only son that was born in the promised land. The tribe of Israel's first king, Saul, most likely where uh, Saul, Paul, even got his name from. The tribe that remained faithful when others did not. The borders of the city of Jerusalem and the temple itself were in the, in, the, in the lot allotted to Benjamin. So he's saying, look, I'm an eighth dayer. I'm an Israelite of the Israelites. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. And he says, furthermore, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, he's par excellence. He's great stock. He's not a mixed breed. He's a pure blood. He's unspoiled, unblemished. Most likely, he was a native Aramaic and Hebrew speaker, even though he came from Greek-speaking Tarsus. He was the real deal. And his national heritage and the things and the privileges that he had in his, in his upbringing, it was all check, 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 check. He's got all the right pedigree. So those are things that he, he didn't have anything to do with. That was God's providence in his life. But then he lists three accomplishments. He said, as to the law... A Pharisee, right? In our day, Pharisees have a really bad name. If someone calls you a Pharisee, they didn't compliment you. But in that day, that was a good thing. You were a separated one. You were part of a pure community. You knew the law of God. You observed the law of God. You were zealous to do these things. You took it really serious. They sought to do all 613 laws that are accounted for in the scriptures, and they weren't only committed to those from the law of Moses, but hundreds of other commandments that were contained in the oral tradition as well, that they found equally binding. And Paul is saying, as to the law, I was a Pharisee. I was zealous to do these things. Remember Christ's words when he said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Christ was saying we are to be zealous for these things. But the problem is, if you're looking to those things to make you right with God, that's the problem. Because it's not through the works of the law, but through faith. But to be concerned about and to care about and to desire to do the things that delight and please God, that's a good thing. In the reading of the law today, we hear, be holy because I am holy. We recognize that is not in our own effort and doesn't 
come to us on our own or through works of the law, but we're called to, to seek these things and do these things. So Paul's saying, as to the law, I'm a Pharisee. And then he goes on to say, as to zeal, he's a persecutor of the church. In other words, he was zealous for God as he understood him at the time. He's zealous for God and his house and his worship and his prayer. He wasn't on the sidelines. He wasn't an armchair quarterback, but he was engaged in a spiritual battle. You remember that he stood by at the stoning of Stephen. And at that time, he thought he was doing the Lord's bidding. He's going to kill these Christians. He's going to stop out this sect who's saying that the Messiah came and that Jesus is risen from the dead and all this nonsense because it was different than Judaism. It was different than what he had said. Of course, we believe it was the fulfillment of all that, but not Paul, not at that time. So he was zealous. He was a persecutor of the church. He was going to stomp out this radical Christian sect and stop this nonsense and this teaching. And he was zealous for that. And the seventh thing says, as to righteousness, he was blameless. That means that he was without reproach, that he was faultless, that he was without guilt or without defect. Clearly, it doesn't mean that he's sinless. No self-respecting Jew would have thought that they could ever be sinless. As a matter of fact, their whole system had sacrifices for all kinds of different sins that they participated in either weekly or annually or what have you. So when he says he's blameless, he doesn't mean that he's sinless. No, nobody would have thought that. But he thought there's nothing that you could bring any charge against him. If he was going to be put forward as an elder or a deacon in their church, nobody could say anything about him. Nobody would have anything to say. He's above reproach. He's faultless. He lives a good and godly and moral life. You can think of the rich young ruler when Jesus asked him, you know, uh, when he asked, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus tells him, and the rich young ruler said, all these I've done since my youth. There's still something that he lacked, <laughs> which the Lord was going to show him, which is what the Lord will show Paul here. But in terms of like looking at these things outwardly, hey, I've done this. He has exemplary conformity to the way of life that's prescribed in the law in terms of outward obedience. Nobody could have brought a charge against him. And so the last thing we want to look at is Paul's accounting as a Christian. So we looked at his warning as a pastor. We looked at his resume as a Pharisee, but... Something changed, didn't it? Paul's accounting as a Christian. One theologian said, although he could confidently boast in all of these things, he came to realize that before God, they were not only useless, but they were damning. It's not that just they were unhelpful, but by relying on them, they were damning him. They were adding weight to him. Paul called himself the foremost of all sinners in 1 Timothy. That's interesting, isn't it? That's someone who had an encounter with the Holy God. That's someone who also saw the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, isn't it? On the road to Damascus, when he heard a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? When he was on his way to go and persecute the church. Notice how closely Jesus identifies with his church, right? What you do to your bride, my bride, you do to me. Why are you persecuting me? And it's in that encounter with the risen Savior that Paul is converted. And he also comes to know his sin and his misery. He comes to know his Savior and also his commissioning to be an apostle to the Gentiles. The very ones that he was trying to kill, the very ones that he was trying to destroy, the very ones who he was just zealous to kill. Now you go tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. You go tell them that Jew and Gentile together are saved by grace alone, to faith alone, in Christ alone. You go and do this. And he does it. Not in his own strength or not for salvation, but because of that encounter, because of the grace. Paul recognized he was the foremost of all sinners. He used to persecute the church of God. He deserved death. He deserved condemnation. He deserved God to snuff him out right then. But instead... He met Jesus Christ in mercy and in grace and now was called to go and tell others about that mercy and grace that they may have life and that they may have abundantly as well. Paul will say in verse 7, this is his, how he counts things, this is how he considers things. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. This is really an, an accounting term, quite literally. 
what he had had in the pro column is now in the con column. What was a profit is now a loss. He used to have power. He used to have prestige. He had a great birthright. He had a great privilege. He had a great pedigree. He was faithful. He was obedient. He was influential. And now, none of those. He was on the fast track as a Pharisee. And now he's going to end up in prison over and over for the name of Jesus Christ and being beaten and being mocked. But all of that is rubbish, he says, dung. It's filth compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He says, indeed, I count everything as loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And we've probably heard that and glossed over that, but let's just think about what he says. Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. What is that confession? When he says he knows that the Christ, he's saying that the Messiah. This is the promised one that he'd read about and heard about and even taught about all throughout the Old Covenant and throughout the Old Testament that a Messiah was coming. Now he's recognized that Messiah has come. A couple of weeks or a couple of years earlier, he would have said, no, no, no. I'm going to kill you for saying that. And now he's saying, the Christ has come. The Messiah has come. The promised one has come. And he calls him Jesus. Which simply means Savior. He looks to him as Savior. He's the Son of God. He's the promised one. He's the Messiah. And note that he says, my Lord. That's personal. Not just a Lord, or not just the Lord, but also my Lord. I don't want you as a pastor to just know the truths of Scripture in general. I want you to know them for you, that you are a sinner, that you are saved, that God loves you. Insert your name here. Not just that he loves in general, or he loves people in general. You. This body broken for you. This blood shed for you. This name given to you. This spirit given to you. You're his sheep. He calls you by name, and you come. This is personal, that I know Christ, the Messiah, Jesus, the Savior, who is my Lord. Different religion, different life, different gospel. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. For Paul, when he says this, this is not a theoretical possibility of losing everything, but a real loss, isn't it? He lost his power. He lost his influence. He lost his prestige in the community. He lost the skin off his back numerous times. He lost his liberty in a Roman prison. He lost his safety, his security, his comfort, and his ease. I haven't even come close to losing what the Apostle Paul lost in my clinging to Christ. But he's saying all of it is dumb. All of it's rubbish. It doesn't even compare to knowing the reality and the person of Jesus Christ, who is my Lord. The treasure worth more than any, everything to Paul is Christ Jesus himself. To gain him, to be found in him, and to know him. Not just about him. Dr. Dennis Johnson, in commenting on this passage, he makes that a little clear for us. He says, for Paul... Christ is not merely a dispenser of saving benefits, forgiveness, acceptance with God, life-transforming power, future resurrection. Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity, is God for whose fellowship we are designed and whose friendship we find our highest joy. It's Christ. Yes, he dispenses and he gives all of these gifts, but Christ himself, he knows him, he loves him. It's he, everything else is a loss compared to knowing him, knowing Christ, not just about him or what he does, but him. And he goes on to say, and to be found in him, this is where we're getting into the title of the sermon, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So there's a tale of two righteousnesses to be found in a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. And scripture makes it clear, beloved, by the works of the law, how many people will be justified? How many? None. So that way, it's impossible. 
The other way is the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God. And so here he's talking about two different kinds of righteousness. There's an achieved righteousness and there's a received righteousness. The achieved righteousness is that which we do on our own, through our own efforts, through our own work, through seeking to appease God on our own, through works of the law. It's self-conferred. We end up being the judge, the jury, and the attorney. It's through the law. And scripture couldn't be more clear that through the works of the law, no one will be justified in his sight. We're by nature children of wrath. We're lost. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. No one seeks God. No one comes. No one is justified through the works of the law. But that's not the, the end of the story. There is a righteousness. There is a way to be made right with God. And that's a received righteousness, a righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus Christ, a gift. It's through faith in Christ. The righteousness that is from God. That's the contrast that the text is making. There's a from the law righteousness, and there's a from God righteousness. And the from God righteousness is giving us Jesus Christ as our Savior. That he came and paid the penalty for all of our law breaking. Beloved, we break the law every day in thought, word, and deed by what we do and by what we left on, what we don't do. And Jesus Christ paid the penalty for all of our law breaking on the cross. That's great news. And we have the forgiveness of our sins. But more than that, his obedience to the law at every moment of his life is credited to us as if we had done it. That's remarkable. I didn't hear that growing up. I heard about the forgiveness of my sins, but it wasn't until my 20s that I heard about the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's radical. So he takes our filthy rags and pays the penalty for them, but then he doesn't leave us standing there naked or say, hey, now go work and make yourself a nice robe. He takes his robe of perfect righteousness and puts it on us. His works, imputed to us, credited to us, and put on us and that we receive that. And so our standing before our, our Father is because of Christ. All of our sins are forgiven. They're imputed to him, and his righteousness is imputed. It's reckoned to us. It's given to us. We sometimes refer to it as an alien righteousness. It comes to us from outside of ourselves. It's not our pedigree. It's not our heritage. It's not our accomplishments. It's a gift, and it's grace. The righteousness upon which we now rest is God's gift. And it's conditioned upon believing, but beloved, even believing is a gift of God. <laughs> You've been given faith. The faith itself is a gift that connects you to Christ who is the Savior, who is your righteousness. Sinclair Ferguson says this, here is the simplicity and freeness of this salvation. Gone are the exertions of law-keeping. Gone are the disciplines of asceticism. Gone are the additions and restrictions of legalism. Gone the anxiety that having done everything, we might not have done enough. We reach the goal not by stairs, but by a lift. Everything that we need, he provides. All of it for us in Jesus Christ. So let me conclude where Paul begins. At the very beginning of the passage in verse 1, he said, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you as no trouble for me and safe to you. Rejoice in the Lord. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rejoice in Christ in particular. It's no trouble for Paul to write these things to you. And it's safe for you. And as a minister of the gospel, there's nothing better that I have to say to you. There's nothing more worthwhile for me to come and tell you about than Jesus Christ and the righteousness that's available in and through him. To tell you stories about myself or my life would be of no interest and of no help to you, but let me tell you about Jesus Christ. It's safe for you. Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evildoers. Watch out for those who add to or take away from Jesus Christ, but listen to and believe those who proclaim to you and placard before you Christ and him alone for your salvation. Him is the author, perfecter, and finisher of your faith. Him is your atoning sacrifice. Him is your righteousness. Him is your sanctification. It's in and through him. 
It's not, he doesn't have his head in the sand when he says rejoice in the Lord. He's probably even writing this from prison. It's not superficial or false cheer, cheerfulness, but it's a positive Christian virtue of joy in spite of the adverse circumstances, trials, and pressures that we look to Christ. And we look to him alone for our salvation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you tell us the truth about our sin and you tell us the truth about our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for an imputed and an alien righteousness. We thank you that uh, we realize that we cannot be right before you through works of the law. And we ask that you would forgive us when we try. We pray that we would despair of all of that and that we would cling to Jesus Christ, that we would cling to the cross alone, that we would rest in the perfect and finished work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is on high, ruling and reigning right now, having conquered sin, conquered Satan, conquered death, paid the penalty for all of our sins, and given us uh, his righteousness as a gift, that we may stand holy and blameless before you. And Father, in light of that freedom, may we love and serve others. May we placard Christ before them as well. And may you use that as an opportunity to bring into your kingdom a multitude unimaginable. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.